Hello, everybody, and welcome to today's live stream. It is wonderful to see so many of you joining us today. And um, as always, we are joined by our curator, Nick Nicholson, who is uh, beaming in from Brooklyn, New York. I am um, Michael Perekrestov, the executive director of the Russian History Museum, and it's wonderful to see all of you on this Tuesday afternoon. Uh, we're going to dive right into uh, the program because Nick has a lot to offer. We're going to be going through a behind the scenes tour of the newly restored Alexander Palace. And um, Nick was able to travel to Russia. He just got back a couple of weeks ago. And so he has a fresh perspective and insider's look on uh, the palace, the restoration that's been going on there. And of course, we're going to be tying in some of the pieces uh, from our collection and showing you some of the items that belonged to the Imperial family that are at the Russian History Museum. And uh, some of them were in the Alexander Palace. So let's dive right into this. Um, but before we start, I do want to say that this is an informal chat conversation, um, uh, a voyage of exploration. So please, uh, submit your questions through the question and answer uh, box in Zoom or the chat box in Zoom. Or if you're tuning in with YouTube Live, go ahead and uh, type in the comments and I will be asking those uh, questions and, and sharing those comments with Nick as we progress. So Nick, why don't you introduce yourself and um, start us off with why you ended up in Russia? What are we seeing in sure. this photograph? And what are we, we gonna be learning about today? Sure. Thank you, Michael. Uh, as Michael noted, my name is Nick Nicholson, and I'm the curator at the Russian History Museum, though I am here in Brooklyn and not up in Jordanville at the museum right now. Uh, Michael mentioned I was able to go to Russia about four weeks ago as the courier for 50 objects from our collection in Jordanville that are temporarily on loan to the Tsarskoye Silo Palace Museum Complex. There is an exhibition there right now called At the Sovereign's Stirrup, which is a history of the convoy, the guards of the imperial family. And you can see here in this photograph, um, a picture that I took during the installation of the exhibition in the gallery, which lies underneath the Cameron Gallery at the Catherine Palace. Um, I was there for two days of very intensive work, helping the staff set up our objects. And then I had about four days until the opening of the exhibition. And so our colleagues at the Catherine Palace arranged for me to have a pretty extraordinary behind the scenes look at a number of sister museums and palaces and it was great to be there and to visit. My last day of touring before the opening of the exhibition was spent at the Alexander Palace, where I was given a tour before the palace opened to the public uh, by Dr. Iraida Bot, who is the director of the Alexander Palace Museum. And I got an important behind the scenes view of the palace. Uh, she begged me not to put any of the photographs on social media until the palace opened to the public on the 13th, which happened last week. Since then, as you probably all know, because you're interested in the palace, the internet is flooded with images of pictures of the palace and variety of levels of quality and a variety of level of information. And I am here not to represent the Alexander Palace Authority. I am not an expert on the Alexander Palace. I am not an expert on the restoration of the palace since 2015. So there may be some questions that I'm not able to answer if you have questions about those. But the goal of this uh, talk was to show pictures of the palace, some of which are from our collection, some of which are not. Uh, objects that were formerly in the Alexander Palace, which are in our collection or have been exhibited at our museum, and to tie them to the recently restored rooms, showing images that I took during the installation of the rooms, as well as featuring some of the quite famous now color autochromes of the rooms, which were taken in 1917, some photographs that were taken of the rooms during the war. And the real effort of this presentation is to give you a tour of the Alexander Palace's private rooms of Nicholas and Alexandra as you would have seen them had you been a guest arriving at the palace at the turn of the century or later. So as we say at the museum, without further ado, <laughs> we will move forward. This is actually from the collection of the Metropolitan Museum. This is the original floor plan and front facade elevation for the Alexander Palace. The Alexander Palace was designed by Giacomo Quarenghi, who was an Italian architect who went to work in Russia at the end of the 18th century for Catherine the Great. He was from Bergamo. He trained in um, 
in Italy, and he was very much influenced by the villas of Andrea Palladio. So he was a real arbiter of the neoclassical style, which Catherine adopted during her reign. And you can see here all the hallmarks of a classical interior and exterior symmetry, uh, resemblance to Roman temples, and um, a solid and rhythmic facade. Now, the Catherine Palace was commissioned by Catherine the Great from Guarigui in 1792, and she presented it as a gift to her grandson Alexander, Alexander the first he became, uh, which is why it is known as the Alexander Palace. It was presented to him on his marriage to his wife, uh, Grand Duchess Elizaveta Alexievna, who was born a princess of Baden, and the palace was turned over to them in 1793, though it wasn't really completed until 1796. Alexander and his wife actually preferred their very simple rooms at the Catherine Palace. And so they spent almost no time in this recently finished palace. It was uh, largely empty um, until at the middle of the 1820s, use of the palace was turned over by Alexander I to his younger brother, Nicholas I. And it was decided that the palace would become the official summer residence of whoever was the heir to the throne. So because Alexander and his wife had no children, Nicholas I was the heir, the Alexander Palace was turned over to him and he moved in in 1825. From 1830 until 1850, there were significant renovations and upgrades to the interior of the palace to make it habitable for Nicholas I and his wife, uh, Alexandra um, Fyodorovna and their growing family. They lived largely in the Western Wing, which you see on the right-hand side, which was called the Garden Wing because it faced the Alexander Park or Garden, as opposed to the left side wing, the Eastern Wing, which is the street side wing. By street, it's not a very busy street. It's Sadovaya Ulitsa. It's a beautiful garden street in Savskia Silo. So it's also a wonderful side to be on. There's no advantage to one side over the other. We're gonna switch the slide now. Uh, by the 20th century, there had been significant alterations to all of the palace. And in this picture, which is a photograph from the architectural reconstruction plan, which was implemented in 2014 by the palace, you can see how the rooms were arranged in the period of Nicholas and Alexandra. We're gonna close up on the Eastern wing, the left side wing, and you're going to see at the bottom of the picture where you see those semicircular steps, that's the entrance to the private quarters with the entrance hall. And then on the right-hand side are the rooms of Nicholas II, the Tsar's reception room, the Tsar's working study, the Tsar's bath, the Tsar's wardrobe, the Tsar's new study. Along the back or the northern part of the rendering, there is the great library, the small library, and the Empress's official reception room. And then proceeding from there, there was the Art Nouveau maple room, the Palisander drawing room, the Mauve study, the imperial bedroom, and then a room that had been divided up into many small rooms, which provided access to the children's quarters on the second floor. So we're going to be going through the rooms in this order, if you can go to the next slide. We're going to approach the palace as we would if we were guests, not guests flying in. This is an aerial view. I just wanted to give you a picture of what the palace looks like when it's not covered in scaffolding, because in fact, right now it still is, except the wing on the left. Um, something that's different now about this picture is the roof has been restored to its original green color, which is really magnificent. And it's sort of a, a shock to see the palace with a green roof again. Next slide. Here is the entrance that guests coming to visit Nicholas and Alexandra would have used unless they were being brought into the most formal rooms of the palace, uh, which are along the north side, in which case they would have entered the center. But if you were a visiting dignitary or an official or a member of the army or one of the Cossack guards and you were going for a reception with the emperor, you would walk right up these stairs into the entry vestibule, which is next. This is the ceiling of the entry vestibule, which des was designed by the Italian architect Danini, and uh, much of the decorative painting was discovered when they started doing the restoration, so it has been restored. It's very simple. It's a transitional space, not one where people would have spent a lot of time. If you change to the next, um, if you change to the next slide, this is the entrance door. Uh, there would have been a pair of guards here, and um, you will notice that. Um, 
the there's a horrible sort of bricked entryway and in fact this was temporarily erected during the course of the restoration and it is only there for fire insurance it's going to come down and there's going to be uh, a restored glass and wooden door that takes up that entire space which is a copy of the original from so the next we have a couple of questions if you don't mind me interrupting sure yeah. i also realized i have to i have to correct myself i said catherine the great son it was her grandson paul the first was catherine's son Alexander the first was his son. It was a gift from Catherine to her grandson. So Sorry, that was one of the questions question. from Agnes. She's asking, so Catherine the second gave her grandson a palace while her son Paul was still the Tsarevich. Could you elaborate on that? Uh, of course, th there was some tension between Catherine and Paul, and she preferred Alexander to, to her own son. But could you talk about is, a little bit about why the Alexander Palace was given to... Sure. Well, this is, this is true, and it's a good observation. However, you also have to remember that that uh, Paul I, when he married Maria Fyodorovna, was given the palace of Pavlovsk, and Paul was already resident at Pavlovsk, and so there needed to be another location for the grandson who was now of marriageable age. What this really boils down to is Catherine was a building addict. She was an architecture freak, and she loved nothing more than to conceive and build these incredible plans. <laughs> so I think she probably would have kept on going <laughs> had she been able to. Good question. So um, another question regarding the restoration, um, so, uh, Leanne is asking about Bob Atchison, who is um, who started the Alexander Palace website in the forum, um, and she's asking, he was working with the Alexander Palace in the 90s and the early 2000s, is he still working there? Is, still, is there still some kind of collaboration between uh, Bob and, and, and the, the website that was created um, and the current Alexander Palace staff, or is there any communication there? Well, that is really a question you have to ask Bob, but I can tell you that um, Bob's relationship with the Alexander Palace goes back even further than that to when Anatoly Kuchumov, who was director during the war, was still the director of the Catherine Palace in the 1970s and early 1980s. Uh, Bob has always been very active in helping the palace, supplying the palace with information and objects that were available to him in the West that weren't available to them. And I think that the palace very much acknowledges uh, that the work that Bob did in the early 90s with his website, putting all of these photographs online, made it easier for them to restore the palace. There are, of course, an enormous number of reference photographs of the interiors available in Russia, but many more were spirited away after the revolution and civil war and are in collections in the West. And Bob's website made it possible for people to share this information very early on. So yes, I would say there is still, of course, a relationship between Bob and the palace, mutual respect and gratitude attitude. And um, it's very exciting for those of us who logged onto Bob's website in the early 90s to see this final fruition. So let's continue on with the tour. We are in the entrance and about to walk into the palace. And what we see next is this hallway. And uh, hall. yeah, Exactly. So this is a view that most people haven't seen. This is the hall that runs the entire depth of the palace. On your left is the entrance to what would have been the uh, lady-in-waiting rooms for the empress and um, access to the children's rooms. And on the right, uh, which you can't see because I'm standing in between the two doors as I take this picture, is the door into the emperor's reception room. The hall runs the entire depth of the palace at the very far end through that open door you can just see the raspberry pink curtains of empress alexandra's corner reception room which is the most formal room in the private apartments at the far end and you can see that the ceiling is dropped um, and creates sort of a, a mezzanine level is sort of in the center of the hall that's because there's a pass-through between the emperor's new study and the maple room of empress alexandra where they could go back and forth but we'll talk about that later. The decoration of the hall is actually um, unknown from photographs. There are no sketches or drawings, but we do know from inventories that while Empress Alexandra and Nicholas were in residence, the walls of the halls, the front hall, were hung with all of the bread and salt trays, which they were presented on various trips around the Russian Empire and by dignitaries who visited them at the Alexander Palace and in St. Petersburg. And the central section was done as a sort of Moroccan living room and the rear section had paintings. So we can imagine this, this hallway as executed by Danini with uh, pink marble accents and then the walls covered with silver and gilded silver and porcelain bread and salt trays. In the next picture, 
you can see um, a view of the ballroom of the governor general's residence in Moscow, which was the home of Empress Alexandra's sister, Grand Duchess Elizabeth. And you can see that Grand Duchess Elizabeth had done the same thing in the largest formal room and the panels inset into the walls. All of the bread and salt trays are hung symmetrically on velvet panels. This is actually a charming picture from a 1902 Empire ball that was thrown at the governor's residence. In the next picture, you can see a marvelous, uh, very, very large scale porcelain charger or bread and salt tray, which may have been um, executed as a trial by the Kornilov porcelain factory at the time of the coronation of Nicholas and Alexandra. But the luxurious decoration on this piece of porcelain gives you an idea that the hallway would not have been a barren place, but one that was rather lushly decorated with highly reflective precious objects in silver, silver gilt and enamel. From the hallway, you would then, if you were a visitor, move into the formal reception room of the emperor. This is an autochrome that was taken in 1917, a color autochrome, color photography, after Nicholas and Alexandra left the palace um, in August of 1917. There were a group of people who came into the palace to take color photographs of the interiors as part of the inventory process. And those autochromes were lost for many years until they came up at an auction in Paris. They were purchased, they were returned to the palace, and they became instrumental in restoring many of the rooms uh, because they were color reminders of what the rooms looked like. The next picture shows the room as it exists today, completely restored. You can see that all of the paneling has been uh, restored. The fireplace has been put back. The furniture has been reassembled. Um, many objects that were original to this room have been returned. And this room is actually one of the more interesting ones in the palace because because it retained its paneling. So there was a restoration involved as opposed to a recreation of the paneling. The uh, wonderful stenciled canvas wall treatments, which sort of look like tapestry, um, were cleaned. And one of the great things you can see here during the installation, they are putting back into the room, they were hanging all of the paintings. Uh, many of the paintings were saved during the Second World War, removed from the palace and sent for safekeeping to other museums. When it looked like the Alexander Palace would never be restored, those paintings were accessioned into the collections of other museums. But there has been a historic uh, loan from all of these sisters institutions of many of the original objects from the Alexander Palace, including the paintings. So you can see right now uh, in the center of this picture, the beautiful portrait by um, the artist Müller Norden of Empress Alexandra Fyodorovna, which was one of Nicholas's favorites and which was done uh, right after their marriage. It's a beautiful portrait. It's been in storage at Pavlovsk for many years. It's now been cleaned and its frame has been recreated and it's back on the walls at the Alexander Palace. Next image. <clears throat> This is um, a wonderful built-in uh, bench next to the fireplace, which I had to throw in simply because the color of this leather is so good <laughs> that I wanted to keep a reference of it. But they've restored the upholstery exactly as it was in the period. The only thing you will notice if you have eagle eyes is there's a big old electrical socket on the floor now where they will probably be vacuuming and polishing the floors for many years to come. Next picture. Here's a close up. You can see the stenciled gilding on the painted canvas. Uh, it's a wonderful treatment and it has held up very well. And I have to say this room is great because you really feel uh, what the palace would have looked like had it been allowed to age on its own accord. Next. Uh, Nick, we have a couple of questions about the restoration process. So first of all, um, uh, one of our um, listeners is asking about the children's rooms and if you had a tour of the children's rooms upstairs and whether there are plans for the restoration of that. And another, um, uh, another uh, attendee asked about uh, any jewelry that was found during the uh, restoration of the, of the palace. Well, we're all of a same mindset. I'm going to talk about the children's rooms at the end of this tour. Um, the answer 
briefly is um, there is a lot of photographic evidence. The plans in the second phase are to restore the children's rooms to their original appearance. Uh, but because of the way the palace is now organized, you can no longer access the children's room from the Imperial apartments on the first floor the way that you were able to when Nicholas and Alexandra were in residence. You have to go up to the second floor. So the children's area is going to be a separate part of the tour. It's no longer uh, intact. But it, that, is a, that is a plan and that will be happening as far as I know. Okay. And the second question, they did not find any jewelry, but we're also going to talk about jewelry and where it might have been in the palace. When and I should, I should say that there were other, uh, there, the question included, were there any other items that were found? And actually, as we walk into Nicholas's, into the Moorish uh, bath, uh, Nick will tell us about some of the exciting finds that were revealed during the restoration process. Absolutely. So what is this uh, lamp that we were seeing in the reception room? This is um, the reception room is interesting because it actually features um, architectural paneling and, and design that was from the period of Nicholas I. It was a slightly earlier iteration, but this electrical light is pure 20th century and it was put in by Nicholas II. The light fixture remained throughout the war, throughout the revolution, all the way through until the present day. But what was restored here were the trails of the sort of amber colored glass beads, which were specially recreated. They diffused the electric light in a very beautiful way. And when they were installed, this chandelier would have been the most modern thing in the room. And we move on now into the work. You can see here actually the, the Herculean effort of putting all of these objects back in their place. This was sort of a staging area for all of the porcelain that was going uh, back into the room. So there are pieces here that went into the working study. There are pieces here that went into the maple room. There are pieces here for the imperial bedroom. Um, they were, they're all over. It was very exciting. Great, next room. This is the, door from which you would pass if you were a visiting diplomat from the emperor's formal study into the working study, which was the next room. Here you can see the working study with a copy of the Kramskoy portrait of Alexander III painted uh, in the 1880s, the working desk, which Nicholas II used. There's a study table you can see in the back, the wonderful mantle and uh, hearth, also a great 17th century uh, English clock on the mantle. Um, and this was a room where uh, Nicholas would have done his reading of papers and uh, small councils. So in the next picture, you can see actually a, a very charming moment. This is Nicholas II actually standing on the mantle in the working study, surrounded by his porcelain collection and his wife's brother, his brother-in-law, Prince Ernst of Hesse is standing right next to him. This is, if you move to the next slide, you can see the restoration of the room. The Kramskoy portrait is back, as is the portrait of Peter the Great on the right. Uh, there are other paintings that have been restored to this room. The carpet was recreated, the paneling was recreated, the tile was recreated. The only thing that's uh, really not original to the room um, in style or design is the chandelier that you can see hanging in the corner. It's not the original one, but they have located the original chandelier in a collection in Nizhny Novgorod, and they are in um, negotiations to try and have that big 18th century chandelier returned uh, to the room. So how about the desk? We have a question from Dom about the desk. Is the desk, um, how did the, the desk survive? Is it, has it the, been replaced? As, as far as I know, the desk has not survived. And at this moment, they're, they're recreating so much furniture, it's being done in stages. And the desk, they may, I, I'm not clear on whether they're going to um, recreate the desk. They paid much more attention to making sure that the furniture was restored for the new study, which we'll see later, where Nicholas spent most of his time, particularly at the end of the reign. And a question about the style of this. Mary is asking, uh, what was the inspiration for the interior design, especially the heavy paneling? Was this a style that was popular at the time or was it hearkening back to an earlier period in Russian history or both? Well, the actual answer is this was a style that was incredibly popular in the third quarter of the 19th century all over Western Europe and the United States. This is a sort of 
Renaissance revival, uh, as it were, you could have probably found these rooms just as easily in houses in Newport or in Chicago or in New York. Um, it was a, it was sort of the de facto masculine style of good taste. The tile work is unusual here and recalls um, Russian. Uh, tiled stoves. We'll see it uh, in other rooms later. But these rooms were really European in style, and they were meant to be uh, comfortable and practical. And so they were quite stylish in the middle and towards the end of the 19th century. This is the temporary chandelier, which you can see. And then a final view of the opposite side of the room. In that alcove, there was a very large and impressive sofa covered in uh, oriental carpets, Turkish carpets, that is being recreated and will eventually go back into that space. The thing we have to remember is um, these rooms are not being restored to be uh, occupied by people again. Not every piece of furniture and every object are going back. They are museum rooms. And like the rooms of the Catherine Palace or Pavlovsk or Gachina, they've been restored to um, the best approximation of the original period uh, to still be suitable for the exhibition of artworks and the presence of guests moving through. Now, were most of the belongings removed or sold or spirited away directly after Nicholas and Alexandra left, or was it a slower process, is a question from one of our attendees. The, it's actually the removal of the objects from the Alexander Palace was phased because Nicholas and Alexandra were there until uh, August of 1917 under house arrest after the abdication. And when they were told that they were being moved to another location, they packed up quite a lot of materials to take with them. Um, there were paintings, books, porcelain jewelry, silver, uh, small pieces of furniture, objects of sentimental interest, icons were all packed up into crates to be taken with them. Um, then after they left and after the October Revolution and after things had settled down, the palace was turned into a museum right away. Uh, so the palace was open to the public uh, from the 1920s up until the Second World War. And like many of the Russian museums in the late 20s and in the early 1930s, many objects were sold sold uh, for, to foreigners for cash. So there was a second phase of objects being removed from the Alexander Palace, particularly valuable ones like pieces of Fabergé, um, objects of art from foreign countries, et cetera. So what ended up happening finally that was the real death blow was the Second World War. The, there was very little time to um, preserve uh, a lot of the objects that remained in the Alexander Palace. The most important pieces of furniture and art were uh, taken away and sent to um, safer locations in Siberia and in St. Petersburg. Uh, and then there objects that were not so important were placed in the basement of the palace in the hopes that um, nothing would happen to it. The Germans arrived, the Spanish arrived, many of the things that remained behind were looted and stolen. And by the time the war was over, the palace itself was so damaged that the objects that had been saved were dispersed among other museums and other collections because it did not appear that the Alexander Palace was going to be restored. So uh, a great many of the objects went to Pavlovsk, went to uh, the Russian State Museum, went to other institutions where they have been carefully preserved since then. Many of them are now on loan back in the palace. And here's a final view of the installation from a few weeks ago showing uniforms of Nicholas II Second and Alexis in the uh, in the study with the picture hanging and much of the porcelain returned. I turned around and got a shot of the damask curtains, which were rewoven for the room as well. They are spectacular in person. Um, I am always worried about textile reproductions, but they just I can't tell you how good the textiles are at the. Uh, restoration. They did a wonderful job using many Italian firms who really helped them. And uh, it's real. Nicholas and Alexandra would recognize everything, I think. Next room. Um, if you were visiting the emperor, you would then leave, you would have left the, the working study through another door. But if you moved through the Enfilad door, you would have walked into Nicholas II's bath. And here is an image of Nicholas II sitting on the platform in his Moorish style bathroom. If you change the, uh, the picture, 
you can see that the entire Moorish bath has been completely restored as well. Uh, you're not able to climb up onto the platform uh, to see the things more closely as a visitor, but I was. So the next pictures are going to show you me wandering all over, uh, taking photographs of the extraordinary tiles which were recreated, the, uh, the depth of the tub is almost eight or nine feet at its deepest point. So it's really a small pool rather than just a bathtub. And the person who was asking about were things saved, this is where we get to tell this story. As you can see, the Moorish bath is on two levels. There's the level with the pool, there's a WC, a toilet up on the secondary level. There's also a mantle. And then there's the ground floor level and the pool passes through both levels. So when the Moorish bath was destroyed largely during the war. And when the room was converted for use as a regular office uh, after the war, the workmen realized that there was a, there was sort of a pit from the bottom of the, the bathtub that sank below the level of the new floor grade. And the workers who did the work it's really quite a miracle. Um, they realized that a lot of the tile from the rooms in the Imperial suite were still in good condition and were salvageable. And they took samples of the tiles from every room, from the working study, from the formal reception room, the mauve boudoir mantelpiece, the maple room, the uh, all of these rooms on the first floor. And they put the fragments of the tiles into what was left of the Imperial bathtub and they sealed it over with flooring. So originally the palace staff thought that they couldn't restore the bathroom because they didn't have any examples of what the color of the tiles was. And then when they started working on the floor, they found the buried piece of the bathtub with all of the tile fragments in it. And that's what made it possible for them to restore and recreate these tiles. Um, the, you can also see here the curtains, which are, are hanging. They were privacy curtains for Nicholas II. And they were done in the Turkish style, I'm not sure how Turkish they actually are, but they were manufactured in England with applique design and broderie anglaise embroidery. And uh, you can see here um, the, the cotton that's been sewn applique onto the, the linen curtains and all of the elaborate embroidery that's been done. So these uh, survived in fragments at the museum and it was possible to recreate them. Excellent. Now, Nick, a quick question from me was, um... Was Nicholas II, was the bath created specifically for him? Was this a reflection of his taste and his style and, and his uh, vision of a bath for himself? It was. It was designed for him by Roman Meltzer, who was one of the court architects and who was responsible for most of the interior work done by Nicholas and Alexandra. Um, the idea of a Moorish bath is not new. There are a lot of very famous Moorish rooms in Russia. Most... Um, not most people will know the ones at the Vladimir Palace and at the Yusupov Palace, which are quite famous, but the Romanovs really enjoyed uh, rooms in this Arabian, Caucasian, Moorish, Orientalist style. And in most of the palaces, there were Turkish uh, reception rooms or Circassian libraries or armories done in this style. So it was something that Nicholas uh, would have grown up seeing and something he clearly wanted for himself. It is a really spectacular bathroom and a good place for an emperor to unwind. You can see in the base of the pool here, the drain. There was a whole system in the basement of the Alexander Palace to create hot water and pump it up and drain it. Here are the steps. Um, there's the, the imperial drain. <laughs> and uh, if you keep going, you're going to see the uh, wonderful ceiling, which is done in a fragrant cedar wood that was based on um, Islamic motifs. It ties in beautifully with the stenciling around the top of the, um, the room as well, which is uh, designs that really come out of the grammar of Islamic ornament, um, though they're not based on anything specific. They're really just a creative interpretation. The next image, you'll see the uh, extraordinary fireplace and mantle, which were completely recreated from scratch from fragments of broken tiles that were found in that tub. If you look to the left of the mantelpiece, you can see a slightly a splotchy area with sort of tan fragments. And if you go to the next slide, you'll see a close up. 
And what you can see is um, these are four of the tile fragments that were found in the bathtub. And all they needed were these four sets of fragments to reproduce the tiles uh, for the rest of the bathroom. So that was that's exciting to see. In the next image, there are niches located on either side of the fireplace. And originally, they had hanging in them these amazing um, Orientalist style lanterns by Fabergé. These are now actually in the collection of the Kremlin Armory Museum in Moscow, um, but they've installed these sort of cibachromes in light boxes. So you get an idea of what it looked like originally. I don't think the original ones will come back to the palace. I think the Kremlin will want to keep their Fabergé. That was actually one of the questions that a few of our attendees were asking is why are there so many pieces that are on loan? Doesn't it, don't they belong to the Alexander Palace? And um, shouldn't they end up there uh, permanently? Uh, officially, um, all of these objects ceased to belong to the Alexander Palace when the Alexander Palace ceased to be a museum after the Second World War. And they were officially accessioned into other collections. I think it is an act of extraordinary <laughs> generosity that the museums have placed these objects back at the Alexander Palace on extended loan. I don't know how long they will be there. It, appears that they will be there a very long time. So I'm sure that these are conversations that are being had at the highest level, but we can be grateful that everything is back there now. And uh, was the, were the pools tiled? What are they made of? Because there's tiles around them, but within the actual basin, so to speak. Within the actual basin tile? of the pool, yeah, it's, it's white, what we would call subway tile. It's mm -hmm. just a very plain white porcelain tile. Um, it would have been terrific to swim in. And in fact, Nicholas II's children, uh, there are several letters where the kids say, can I please take a bath in your, in your pool while you're away? <laughs> so it was, it was a treat uh, for the Grand Dukes and Grand Duchesses to get to bathe in their, in their father's bathtub. Next. Right. Um, Nicholas was also, um, oh, I couldn't resist. This is the Imperial Toilet. Um, this is the WC, the water closet. Um, originally, they weren't planning to restore this at all, but then they found the tiles and they felt they couldn't leave it out. So if you look here, you can see the interplay of the tiles uh, in the two different colors of the door open. And if you go to the next picture, you can see inside, that is where the toilet would have been. Um, they're not going to actually put a toilet there because you can't see it it's not a big deal. And they've got um, HVAC and all kinds of electrical systems hidden behind that panel. But um, I wanted to make sure this was here largely because many people may have seen there's a film um, that's online showing people visiting the Alexander Palace. They say it's 1918, it's actually from the early 1930s, but it specifically makes a point of showing this room with artwork hung in it. So I wanted people to see the actual room where that film footage was taken. So was there actually artwork in there originally? Or no, there was, there, was no, there, there was no artwork. And one of the things we'll talk about a little bit is in the 1930s, um, there was a Soviet story about Nicholas and Alexandra that needed to be made they needed to make a propagandistic point to everybody who toured these rooms. So every effort to make the rooms look ridiculous was done. And so portraits of Empress Alexandra were hung in the toilet. Oh, um, okay. Yeah, which was pretty pretty poor taste, uh, to say the least. Um, but anyway, well, th that's the least interesting part of this story. So we can move forward from that. Next. Um, this is actually <clears throat> a shot from the platform looking down into the rest of the bath with the curtains. And you can also see Nicholas II's chin-up bar. Nicholas was very athletic and he had weights and a chin-up bar in many of his uh, residences. There was one at Livadia, also at Peterhof. Um, but here's the one that was set up in his, uh, in his bath. One of the interesting things about this also, there were other things that were in the bathroom. He had a parrot that he had inherited from his father, Alexander III, called uh, Petrov, I believe, who lived there and uh, squawked a lot. Um, and he also kept in the window a table where he put all of his Fabergé cigarette cases. The last thing he would do when he left the room was he would choose the cigarette case for the day. They would be laid out for him. In the next picture, you can see a, um, a broader view. And the next one we'll show you is a period view. This is looking back towards the um, working study. And this is how the room appeared when Nicholas uh, was there. 
In the previous pictures, you may have noticed the walls are all painted tan, but here you can see tata Japanese tatami mats were hung on the walls in order to control the moisture in the room. And I believe that they have been rehung uh, since I was there. Um, you'll see there are a lot of small pictures, watercolor paintings by his wife, by his children. That's the table um, at which the Fabergé would have been laid out. And now we're gonna turn around and walk further into the next room which, uh, what, here we go, yep, walking right in. And the next room was in the early 20th century divided into two rooms. The left half was the room for the valet de chambre, Nicholas II's uh, male body servant. And it would have been a place for him to rest and wait while he was waiting to serve the emperor. Then the other side of the room was the emperor's wardrobe with closets, which you can see here. Originally, the ceiling of this room was lowered and was probably at the height of the tops of these cabinets, which are eight or nine feet tall. They're very, very tall. So don't think that the room was cramped in any way. And in the previous picture, you can see what looks like a closet. That is in fact what remains of the door through which uh, people were able to go back and forth at the mezzanine level in this room. So that'll give you a sense of scale. The doors into the hall have been restored to their original uh, early late 18th century size, which is why the, the roof lines don't line up from room to room and sometimes the floors don't line up exactly. But now, um, Nick, we um, speaking of this door and access for servants, we had a question from Ronnie asking about whether you got a tour of the basement of the palace. And is it true that any secret passageways have been discovered during the restoration process? First of all, I was not given a tour of the basement because they're still working on it. Secondly, while they were working on um, the pre-construction in the basement, they discovered the Danini built kitchen tunnel, which was the tunnel that went from the basement of the Alexander Palace to the Alexander Palace kitchens building on Sadovaya Street. Um, the basement of the palace is being retrofitted. So it's going to have exhibition space, a bookstore, a small cafe, um, and I believe an auditorium for lectures, which will all be uh, in the old space. The tunnel has been sealed up. As far as I know, no other tunnels were discovered. So here you can see these cabinets. These is from our collection. This is a hanger. This hanger actually comes from the Alexander Palace. You can see in Russian, it says Tse a de on the bottom for Tsarska Sielski Aleksandrovsky Dvoryets, the Alexander Palace at Tsarska Silo. And um, these are the kinds of, um, clothes that would have been in those. These are a pair of trousers that belong, military trousers that belong to Nicholas II, which are part of our collection. They were a gift to our institution from Grand Duchess Ksenia. And here is a uniform of the Imperial Escort. This was not Nicholas II's, but Nicholas II had one just like it. So we thought we would show the kinds of things that were in the uh, dressing room. We're moving on into the next room, which is the new study of Nicholas II, designed by Roman Meltzer. Here's a photograph of the room as it existed uh, when it was a museum in the 1930s. In the next picture, you will see what it looked like immediately after the Second World War. It had been completely destroyed. The staircases removed all the mahogany paneling, much of the bronze work, everything was destroyed. So there was really no hope for a long time of restoring it to its original condition. But if you go to the next picture, you will see that the room has been absolutely restored to its original condition with as many of the surviving objects as possible. The new study was a room for Nicholas II that served a number of very important purposes. There's a desk at the far room, which you can see under the amazing monumental portrait of his father, Alexander III, where he could work. There was a table where he could eat with his officers or with people who had come to visit or with family members who had come to see him. There was a billiards table where he could relax over a game. And then there are multiple seating areas for guests. The small stairs go to a secondary mezzanine where there was a place where he could lie down if he needed to take a little nap. And there was also a door that went straight into the mezzanine of Empress Alexandra's maple room, which we'll be coming to in a minute. The next picture shows uh, some of the wonderful objects that are there. You can see the fireplace, which has been restored. You can see there fragments of the carpet. They had literally just carpeted the room when I arrived. So there were uh, pieces of old carpet everywhere. The, uh, here's a wonderful view back towards the um, very art modern um, mantelpiece in tiles and this corner sofa, which was very popular with the Imperial family. You can see actually Michael pointed it out. I had not noticed it. The sculpture on the top 
was a reduction of a monument by um, Konstantin Eisenberg and architect Alexander von Hohen that commemorates um, the torpedo boat uh, Stribushi, the Vigilant, uh, which went down during the Russo-Japanese War. The monument was installed in 1911, so Nicholas kept a reduction of it here in the palace. Some of these pictures are original to the room, some of them are not. The portrait of uh, Cesarievich Alexei was found rolled up in an attic in a house in Sarsky Silo where it had been stuck during the revolution or the war. It has been restored and is now hanging here. Next picture. So quick question, Nick, um, was the destruction that was done in World War II mostly the result of looting or why was so much taken out of the palace? It was looting. Um, you have to remember that uh, Leningrad was under siege for 900 days. Parts of um, Tsarsky Silo were occupied by the Germans and parts of it was occupied by the Spanish fascist troops that came to help them. Uh, as you know, famously, the Catherine Palace was completely destroyed by the Germans uh, by shelling and by fire. The Alexander Palace as a building miraculously escaped, but the objects in it did not. Great, moving on. Here's a wonderful piece. You can actually see a patch with the original stenciling and the original paint color. I have a close up, I think, in the next picture, so you can really see it. For a long time, it was thought that this room was sort of a pale jade green, but they discovered in testing that, in fact, the room was this sort of uh, sapphire blue. And it seems to me that this is. Um, it's a color combination with the red carpet that's jarring to our eyes, perhaps, but it is a lush sort of jewel toned Art Nouveau interior, fairly typical. And I think that the blue and red are probably allusions to the Russian flag of blue, white and red. Um, you can go to the next picture. There's the corner with the wonderful portrait of Alexander III, just waiting for the desk to come back. And again, some beautiful 20th century lighting fixtures, which have been completely uh, recreated for the room. A callback uh, portrait of Empress Alexandra has returned to its original place. This is the hallway under the mezzanine level. If you come out of the new study, which is the mahogany door on the left, you are directly across the hall from the maple room, which we're going to go to in a minute. If you look down the hall, you're looking back towards the front door where we came in, but now we're going to move into uh, more formal reception rooms that are attached to the great reception rooms of the palace. One of which is the small library. This is an autochrome of the small library from 1917, showing it as it looked uh, at the end of the period when Nicholas and Alexandra lived there. Next picture shows the room today. They have recreated the bookcases which were originally in that room. They've brought back some of the existing English chairs. There is a move um, to continue to restore this room. Hopefully a carpet will, will come in. If you take the next picture, uh, you can see the bookcases which have been recreated after the original designs. They're pretty spectacular and very, very tall. And here is another view of the small library. Beyond it, you can see the corner reception room that we'll be coming to a little bit later, uh, as well as a sculpture on the floor by Anta Kolsky. Then the next picture, uh, you can see the original chandelier has been returned to the room, which is very exciting. It's an 18th century Russian chandelier that's been electrified. And in the next picture, uh, you can see the far end of the room with the quite famous uh, sculpture of Peter the Great by Mark Antokolsky, who was one of Nicholas and Alexandra's favorite sculptors. The room beyond this is the large library. Oh, sorry, we've got books from our collection. Uh, these are two books from the collection of Nicholas II at the Alexander Palace. Um, so you can see his monogram at the bottom. And uh, we have a couple of books actually that came out of the libraries that we just looked at. The next vision, this is the um, large library, and this is again an autochrome from 1917. And you're going to notice when we go to the next picture that the room is rather different. Though the ceilings, floors, lanterns, and walls have all been restored, you can see that the bookcases are slightly different. It was decided in this room, instead of making new reproductions of the bookcases that had been there before, to use a set of antique bookcases which had been designed by the architect Stasov for the Synod of Bishops in St. Petersburg. These are all period and um, they fit. 
And it's wonderful, I think, actually, that they were able to use these other bookcases, which are of the period of the palace um, in the rooms to aid in the impression of what the rooms looked like before, uh, rather than filling the room with uh, reproductions, which is not really what museums are about. So it's wonderful to see these Stasov bookcases restored and used effectively in this space. And I couldn't resist, they were beginning to put pieces from the, the room back. So here's a wonderful bust of uh, Alexander III talking to his father, Alexander II, <laughs> sitting on the table. And again, a book from our collection, formerly in the large library. Now we are moving into the Empress's corner study. This was the most formal room that Empress Alexandra used for entertaining dignitaries and guests. Uh, you can see it was a mixture of 18th and 19th century furnishings done completely to her taste. There's a very large and magnificent painting by Detail on the wall of uh, Cossack troops. We actually have a wonderful engraving of it in our collection that's signed by the artist, but we don't have a great picture of it to show you. I'm sorry about that. And you can see in the next picture, how this room has come across restored. Many of the pieces of furniture uh, that belong to this room and artworks that belong to this room have been returned. The uh, chandelier is back, the extraordinary carpet is back, the Empress Alexandra's piano and organ have been returned. Several of the console tables have come back. The suite of chairs that was originally in the room uh, no longer exist. So instead of making copies, they took a set of chairs that were similar from, um, that were designed by Charles Cameron for another room at the Catherine Palace and they used those instead. They took the opportunity to restore those. They're upholstered in the same fabric that the original chairs were upholstered in. Those of you who are eagle eyed will also notice the large Aubusson tapestry, which is a copy of the painting of Marie Antoinette and her children by the French artist Elizabeth Vichy Lebrun. This was a gift to Empress Alexandra by the French state. And if you keep going, you can see how this room looked during setup with uh, paper everywhere and uh, moving things around. The painting you see on the left there also is the painting of Nicholas and Alexandra's coronation by the Danish painter Tuxen. Um, it's wonderful that that is back in the room as well. What I love about this painting, I think it's actually kind of funny. You'll see Nicholas and Alexandra are standing at the height of the coronation. Um, the Empress has just been crowned and they've turned to face the guests, but all the light is on the Danish born princess, Maria Fyodorovna. <laughs> <laughs> so she's the widow of the, the previous emperor and she is scene stealing as usual. And the next picture is a view of the opposite side of the room. Uh, as it exists today, all restored, you can see um, several of the sofas and chairs from the original room that are back in place. And the wonderful sort of raspberry or carnation pink curtains, um, which are very, uh, a color really typical of the period. And you cannot see from this picture how beautiful they make the light in the room. It's really, really well done. Next picture. This is the room as it looked when I came on a slightly cloudier day with all of the furniture covered in plastic as everybody was setting things up. But what I did get to see, uh, and you'll see it in the next picture, is the wonderful portrait by Kalbach of Empress Alexandra, which has been restored to the palace and is back in the room, hanging where it always was on the far wall. This is, I think, one of the best paintings of Alexandra, really at her regal, beautiful best, um, wearing her Kukli uh, sapphire and diamond sweep. And in this next picture, um, which we exhibited in our exhibition, uh, Last Days of the Last Tsar, is a photograph of the four grand duchesses. You will recognize the carpet. And in the background behind them on the wall is the portrait of their mother, which we just saw. So this is a room that the family used rarely, except for important entertaining and photography. And the room that they really spent more time in is coming up next we move to the Maple Room. And the Maple Room is the, <clears throat> the room which was really Roman Meltzer's masterpiece. It was, I would say, the most formal of the most private rooms of Nicholas and Alexandra. Uh, this was not a room that was open to the public or to strangers. You only were invited to the Maple Room if you were very close intimate of the family. And this is an autochrome from 1917 showing the room as it looked after many of the things had already been taken, including the plants. But in the next picture, which is also an autochrome, you can see how it looked um, when the palms and uh, all of the ferns that were usually in the room were in place. The 
hallmark of Art Nouveau architecture is the play between what is inside, what is outside, what is real, what is an illusion. So the uh, organic forms of the flowers supporting the ceiling and the balcony interplay with the forms of the plants that are there as well. It's a, it's a wonderful um, sort of undulating look. The next picture shows the room as it has been um, after the war. You can see that the plaster is badly damaged. Everything has been taken away. The balcony has been broken down and it was in terrible shape. So the stairs are partially broken leading up to the mezzanine. But it was decided that the room would be completely restored to its original condition. And so the next picture will show you the entrance through the maple door into the maple room. And then the next picture is of the room as it exists now. They completely rebuilt the mezzanine level and stairs that you can see out of maple. The paint treatments have been restored. This photograph is the light is a little blown out. So you can't see that in fact, the cove moldings and plaster work are painted pale green um, in the cove, coves of the ceiling. And the ceiling itself is a pale bluish white, but you'll see it better in the next pictures. We're gonna go up the mezzanine stairs. And now we're standing on the mezzanine overlooking the room. This is a stained glass mirror surround in the Art Nouveau style that has been completely recreated from photos photographs, from which we get a reflection in the beveled glass of the blue ceiling, the green cove, and the Art Nouveau plaster work in the cove molding. If we go forward, you'll be able to see that the upper mezzanine was divided into sections. This little section was where the Empress would lie down. There was a divan for her here in the same way that there was one in the Mauve Boudoir, which we'll see soon. Um, those wonderful sort of Minton tiles along the top of the balustrade conceal planters. So there would have been plants in those as well. You can see a large selection of porcelain, some of which is original to the room, some of which has been acquired to fill in the space because Nicholas and Alexandra really had a large collection of Art Nouveau ceramics and pottery. The next picture shows the opposite side of that room across the fireplace where there was yet again a corner sofa. Nicholas and Alexandra couldn't have a room without putting a corner sofa in it. They found them very cozy. And for those of you who recognize um, the, the rooms, uh, this is quite a famous sculpture that was in the original, uh, in the original rooms. Nick, uh, as we were preparing for this live stream, I um, shared that this is one of my favorite rooms. I think the style uh, appeals to me, but it was quite controversial because what was this before and why was it so controversial to have this uh, Meltzer interior done in this particular part of the building? Well, good question. In fact, if you look at the floor plans at the beginning, um, this room and the new study, which are next to one another, occupied really one of Quarenghi's masterpiece rooms, which was the music room of the Alexander Palace. There was a marble and scagliola panel neoclassical room that stretched the width of the entire wing. And in order to build this room and the new study, that room was taken down. And it was regarded at the time as a terrible mistake. Um, but Nicholas and Alexandra wanted rooms for themselves and they could do it. What then, even further, um, their choice of this sort of Art Nouveau style uh, post-1905 was really frowned on um, by members of the nobility who thought that it was really sort of bourgeois and common and uh, not very aristocratic or imperial. Um, it was one of the many things they blamed Empress Alexandra for. In fact, um, I have to say, looking back on it, it was incredibly forward thinking and modern of both Nicholas and Alexandra and these rooms, now that they are recreated, represent a really unique expression of Art Nouveau in Russian architecture that we don't see anywhere else. So um, I think it's a, a good thing that they were these rooms were put back. There was talk for a while that they would actually restore the music room rather than these two rooms, but I'm glad they made this choice. This is the um, maple door that passes through the mezzanine level into Nicholas's new study. And you can see in the next picture where I get closer, this is where they found the original fragments of plaster work and paint that gave them the clue to the correct colors for the maple room. They had done a paint analysis, which had come up with a color that everyone felt was too dark. Um, and it wasn't until they found 
this patch that they realized that they had found the correct color because there was more of it to sample. So uh, here, Iraida Bot is pointing out the correct color and also the secret to how um, this plaster and stucco work was attached to the walls was revealed when they found these various pieces. So um, they were able Nick, since we're at the door, um, Kelly is asking, I know that the mezzanine was used as proof during or after the revolution that Alexandra would come in and listen to her husband's meetings. Is there any truth to these rumors? I can't tell you. Um, I have read Alexandra's diaries and not in any of them did she say, I snuck through the passage to the new study <laughs> to listen to the meeting. Um, I think if you uh, learn, the more one learns about the life of the imperial family and the character of the emperor and the empress, while the empress had very strong opinions on what was happening politically, she was not a spy and she did not dictate to her husband what he should do. She gave her ideas and um, he promptly ignored a great many of them. So I don't think we're looking at people sneaking back and forth and listening to meetings and that's just propaganda. We'll move on. This is a, one of the wonderful pieces that has been loaned back to the Mauve Boudoir. This is a Kalbach portrait of Grand Duchess Elizabeth Fyodorovna. I think probably the best portrait of her. Kalbach thought that it was, um, it was the best portrait of her that he had done. He had done many sketches of her and he said that it was impossible to get, I love this line actually, it was impossible to get a good likeness of her by drawing from life. You had to remember her to produce a good likeness. He felt that her her beauty was something that you experienced rather than actually saw. So I like that. This is an overall view of the uh, far wall of the maple room and you can really see how it's organized here. And you can also see the extraordinary textiles, the curtains which appear gold from a distance when you look at them. But when you get up close to them and when the light shines through them, this is a a wonderful shade with lace trim that's in a buttery yellow. I will, I'll go back to that in a second. But in the next picture, when the light shines through that silk, what you get is coral and orange and gold and periwinkle blue. It's a phenomenal effect. Um, the sun really lights up these curtains and these were recreated by a Russian firm. They are extraordinary. And what's really interesting is you realize the intentional and theatrical manipulation of light in this room because all of the light that comes from the outside windows was filtered through the yellow silk and linen or this extraordinary brocade uh, curtain in silk. So there was always in this room a kind of perpetual sunset color which hit uh, the rosy walls. It's really fascinating. I think I saw a question pop up. Yeah, so speaking of questions uh, from Laura, she says, I know there was a lot of controversy about the colors of paint and wood in the reconstruction. After viewing them in person, would you say that the controversy has merit? I, what I will say is that no photograph does these rooms justice and the experience of standing in them is very different than looking at photographs of them. I had heard both from professionals and non-professionals concern about the color of the silk in the mauve boudoir that disappeared for me when I was in the room because it looks really different in person. Um, I understand the choices that were made by the staff and I respect them for the research that they did uh, in making those choices. Here is a shot of the corner sofa in that room. Originally, there were uh, Kalbach portraits of all the children in this corner. Those were sold in the 1930s um, and are sort of lost to us. But there are new pictures that are of the type that would have been there. You can see on the left, a Kalbach portrait of Marie of Romania, who was a cousin of both Nicholas and Alexandra. And at the bottom, a wonderful Fleming portrait of Empress, uh, sorry, of uh, Grand Duchess Elizaveta Fyodorovna, which was a gift to the palace from uh, Michael Ilinsky. And uh, then there are other wonderful pictures that were restored and returned. You'll see in the next picture, there is the rather famous painting of Nicholas II by George Becker, which uh, has returned to its original place and is back in the 
maple room. In that cabinet is where Alexandra kept her Fabergé eggs. And in this next picture, you can actually see um, how it looks installed today with all of the art pottery. The Fabergé eggs are, as we all know, dispersed and are not coming back because they're in a variety of different collections. But you can see in the next picture uh, how this room was used by the family. There are uh, the Empress's three girls sitting right in that recreated corner with their portraits over their heads. This is about 1906. If you were very close to the Imperial family and you left the Mauve room, you would go directly into the Palisander room. And I have to say, of all of the rooms that I visited in the Alexander Palace, the Palisander room was the one that made my hair stand on end when I walked into it. It's not a room I ever really thought about particularly, to tell you the truth, but um, they have it's a phenomenal phenomenal recreation it's like stepping into the autochrome you can see here the original autochrome from 1917 in the next picture there's the recreation uh the color of the silk reads too yellow in pictures and in fact it's kind of a lemongrass color it is unbelievably beautiful and it goes very very well with the palisander paneling palisander is a rosewood a very expensive type that came from south america so all of the wood in this room was ordered from south america and brought to russia at great expense the next picture is um oh sorry i don't know how that's a mistake keep moving here is uh, an autochrome, which is a view from the Mauve boudoir into the Palisander room showing the sofas where the family used to sit and a large um, hydrangea in a vase. Since this was taken in September of 1917, that is probably the Empress's hydrangea still sitting there um, from when they left. The pictures on the walls you can see are pictures of Rumrod Castle, her childhood, one of her childhood homes, and pictures of relatives. In the next picture, you'll see that those pictures have been restored to their original locations, and you can see them back on the walls. Um, they will uh, presumably remain there for the time being. There's the wonderful portrait of Rama Kessel. And you can see the Mauve boudoir through. Here is a great shot of the mantelpiece. Nicholas II referred to this room as Chippendale. I don't know why. It bears absolutely no resemblance to anything by Thomas Chippendale. Um, but what it does show us is that they felt that this room was uh, English in style and in nature. The next picture, you can see a wonderful period photograph of the room with all of the objects intact. And Michael, if you will blow up that small cabinet to the right of the... Uh... Unfortunately, I can't with this photograph. Oh, uh, sorry. Either the well, resolution, but here... If you see where that little hand is, is swizzling around, you can see a tiny sculpture of a horse. And if you go to the next picture... Um, oops, one more. Where'd it go? Oh... Oh, I don't know what happened. Go back. Sorry. Well, I'm sure we'll see it. Uh, we'll see it. I don't know what happened to it, but we uh, we'll show you the horse when it shows up. <laughs> this is this is a uh, next picture. Uh, this is the far wall with a portrait of um, Alexandra's father as a young man and the door that leads through into the Sanctum Sanctorum, the Empress's private room, the Mauve Boudoir. Um, if we move forward, you can see the palisander in this room. You'll see the, um, this is a sofa and a table and chairs. The palisander room was also where Nicholas and Alexandra and the children often had meals. So a table would have been set up for them. As a result, we have some objects in our collection that are related. The uh, next photograph is, um, you can see how the setup was in the period with the table for dining. Then in the next picture, you can see uh, a plate from the Sarskasielski service. This was sort of the everyday service of the palaces at Sarskasielo and the uh, porcelain, which would have been used most frequently by the family in the palace at Niels. This is now in our collection and it was brought from the Alexander Palace with the Imperial family to Tobolsk and later to Ekaterinburg. And then from there it came to our museum as did this napkin where you can see woven into the jacquard, the monogram of Nicholas II right here in the corner. We also have um, a tablecloth, which was part of the Imperial suite. And as you can see, cross-stitched into it is CS for Tsarskie Silo. This was probably done um, so that the, they would know which uh, tablecloths and napkins went to which palace after the laundry was done. Um, so now, you know, Nick, uh, the, the tablecloth has somewhat of an Art Nouveau style to it as well. Um, and this is a good chance for me to ask a couple of questions. One from Carolyn. Uh, did Alexandra's sister, Grand Duchess Ella, share her interest in the Art Nouveau? How does the design of their rooms 
in their respective palaces compare with one another? And uh, Gabriella is asking, how was the room used? And I think you just answered that uh, it was sort of the, the family room where they would gather and, and have meals once in a while, right? Correct. Um, the two questions. Um, Empress Alexandra and Grand Duchess uh, Yelizaveta Fyodorovna both were raised in Darmstadt, where there was a very active arts community working in the Art Nouveau, or as they call it, Jugendstil in Germany style. So they grew up surrounded by artistic people, and their brother, Ernst, was very much a proponent of this kind of style. So um, it was part of their cultural upbringing to be attracted to contemporary artists and contemporary styles. They were very modern in their thinking that way. Um, that said, Elizabeth had a very early, important early influence on Alexandra when she did her first rooms uh, at the Alexander Palace, which we're looking at now, the Palisander Room, the Mauve Room, and the Imperial Bedroom. But she had slightly less influence on Alexandra when Alexandra did the Maple Room slightly later and the new study. So um, they began to diverge at that point. The thing that I will say about both of the sisters is because their mother was English and they had spent a lot of time in England, English rooms were really what they were looking at rather than French rooms. They loved rooms that were cozy and comfortable and unpretentious where multiple things could be done in one room where you could read, you could eat, you could do all kinds of things. So they were looking at English studies um, more than they were looking at formal French rooms. So how do we know that they were uh, the family was credit criticized uh, for the interiors that were too bourgeois? Were there diary entries? Um, this is one of the questions that was posed by our audience members. Yes, there was there was muttering um, around uh, St. Petersburg. I, I think people in St. Petersburg really had better things to do with their time than criticize the Empress's interiors. But some of the criticisms have come down to us. Um, Polovtsov, for example, didn't really like them, um, and uh, there were you know, many uh, people who felt that the uh, imperial family had an obligation to um, preserve uh, cultural interiors and to live in a very certain dramatic way. Um, they didn't, didn't like new things. So there was, there was a certain amount of criticism. Now, the other thing we have to remember is that much of that criticism came later because when the Mauve Boudoir was installed in 1894, 1896, it was considered very stylish and beautiful. But by 1917, it was 20 years old and it was very outdated. And so criticism of Empress Alexandra that was largely motivated by the war um, fell on her interior choices as well. Um, we all know what it's like when first ladies get criticized for their clothes or their hair when something else is going on. And I think there was a, something very similar happening in that period. But we move, these are the final pictures of the installation of the Palisander Room. And now- Sure, gonna... and just to answer Antonio's question about the original vases being on the floor, I did want to clarify that um, some of the photos that you see were taken by Nick during his behind the scenes tour. So this was just prior to the restoration, just as they were putting the finishing touches on the room. So that's why you see some of the thing, items misplaced. And it can be a little bit confusing because we're interspersing the final product with autochromes. Uh, from the early 20th century, as well as Nick's private uh, behind the scenes photos. Exactly. Now we move into the Mauve Boudoir. We've got two very interesting autochromes uh, showing the room in the rooms in 1917. You can see there's still um, needlepoint in a basket at the foot of the bed, uh, the foot of the divan over on the left. All of the pictures are still in place. In the next one, you see a view across the room, but you can see that all the shelves have been cleared of family photographs. Clearly, um, Empress Alexandra took those with her to Tobolsk, so they were removed with a number of other personal items. And then in the next pictures, you can see the room as it exists today. And I have to say that in person, in these photographs that come from Saskia Silo, the, the purple of the lilac silk looks very, very pink. And it's not, it's really a gray purpley blue. Um, if you look in the next picture, it changes color again. You can see it looks like the silk of the chair and of the curtain is a totally different color than the silk on the walls. It's not, it's the same color. So there's enormous variation um, in the fabric here and it plays tricks with your eyes as you're in there. The mauve boudoir was done in um, 
Kutrumov, Anatoly Kutrumov, who was the curator of the palace uh, in the 30s, described it as, um, as French, Louis XV. It's not really. Uh, many of the chairs have Chippendale backs, English style backs, but then they have French legs. So it's really a sort of Belle Epoque confection of um, styles that have all run together. This is the room where Empress Alexandra spent most of her time. It's where her closest female friends came to spend time with her. It's where her children uh, read and did studies sometimes, um, where the family sat together in the evening when Nicholas would read to them, uh, where the children worked on embroidery and other crafts projects. Um, you can see in the next picture, um, this is a closer idea. In my, in my perception of color, this is closer to what it looked like to me when I was there. It's a little paler and a little warmer. Um, you can see they are in the process of putting things up, getting pictures hung, there are racks, there are things down. And to the left, you can see um, by the divan, there are um, planters uh, for the plants that have now gone back into the rooms. They're going to have flowers in these rooms all the time now because they're an intrinsic part of the, of the design of the rooms. Next picture. Here's the opposite side of the room. Again, I think this color is a little more accurate. Um, the piano was an important part of the, the room. It's where all of the girls learned to play the piano. The Empress played beautifully. And uh, this is not the original piano. This is a piano by the same maker of the same period that was uh, painted ivory so that it would go. So we have a, an old piano in the room, which is nice. Now, this is an earring which belonged to Empress Alexandra. Those of you who are aficionados of the Romanovs will notice that she wears these in almost every photograph. There are photographs of her wearing these almost every day. In the mauve boudoir, to the right, to the left of the mantelpiece, but to the right of one of the um, wall seating areas, you can see right there that little library nook, right in that back panel where the, you can see the cursor, uh, was a safe where the Empress kept her jewelry and it was hidden around the corner and behind. And so that's why we have some images of jewelry associated with this room because it's where Alexandra kept her personal things. This cross in emeralds and diamonds also belonged to the Empress. Uh, one of her attendants later said it had been a gift to her from the Dowager Empress. You can see that it once had pearls. We're back at the, uh, at the piano. Uh, that's Iraida Bot, director of the palace, looking at some of the pictures that have been placed on the piano. And in the next picture, you can see uh, Grand Duchess Olga, I believe, sitting at the piano, um, having her piano lesson. And you can see um, all of the books and sheet music and pictures and Victorian clutter that uh, filled the room. I, I, I actually, um, in our run through, we, you didn't have photos of these and I was, pleasantly surprised to see how much how lived in these these <laughs> rooms looked um and in another one with alexandra where there's tons of things on on every horizontal surface <laughs> exactly well here's a, here's another place to compare this is empress alexandra's divan where she spent a lot of her time as everybody knows she had back and leg issues so she spent a lot of time lying down in the next picture you can see her in that location and what i believe is on that table is mail i think those oh, wow. are I think those are her letters and she spent a lot of time in bed reading and writing letters. You can see all of the pictures uh, surrounding her as well. All of those things came with them uh, to Tobolsk when they left. And in the next picture, um, we've got uh, some needlework. This is in our collection. This is an embroidered bookmark by Grand Duchess Tatiana, but this is the kind of needlework that the family would have done when they were all sitting together. In the next picture, we can see this is the famous uh, armchair in the corner. Uh, it's not quite at the right angle and uh, you can see there are some chairs in the way, but it has been completely recreated and it's back where it belongs. Many of you will be familiar with the fact that uh, Nicholas and Alexandra took photographs of almost all of their friends and family sitting in this chair. And I couldn't figure it out. Uh, I couldn't figure out why until I was in the room. It's because that's where the light is good. There's beautiful light coming in through that window all the time. And it's probably the only place you can get a decent shot with a camera. So in the next picture, you'll see uh, there's Nicholas uh, sitting in the chair reading the newspaper, which he often did. Um, and so we actually have two yeah. questions about this famous chair. First of all, is the one that, that's there now, is that the original? And secondly, from Laura, um, 
is it, will the lamp be restored above the famous chair? Um, my understanding is yes, the lamps are coming back. I think that some things are taking longer than expected and um, it is not the original chair. It is a recreation of the original chair. The original chair was lost. The only piece of original furniture that survives in the Mauve Boudoir is the heavily restored desk of Alexandra Fyodorovna. And I don't have pictures of it because it hadn't yet arrived when I was there, but it's now in place, I believe. That desk was found by Anatoly Kuchumov in the park uh, where it had been thrown by the Germans when they retreated and it was in pieces and it has been restored. It's a pretty extraordinary story. From... Um, speaking of uh, original pieces, Becky is asking, will the Annunciation by Nesterov be returned to the palace? I would tend to doubt it as the Annunciation is now at the Tretyakov in Moscow with a lot of other of Nesterov's work. I would not rule out a very good copy being painted and put back. And I, in fact, I hope they do because that was the Empress's focal point in that room and it would be beautiful to see it back there. But the original is in another museum and will not move. This is one of the 1917 autochromes of the, um, imperial bedroom and it is frequently shown reversed so I corrected it to the right direction. You can see where Nicholas and Alexandra had their wash basin. In the next picture um, you can see the same view today. The, um, the basin is restored and it's back against the wall. The uh, dressings and canopies of the imperial beds have been restored. The carpet has been restored. They are building the furniture as fast as they can to fill this room with all of its original pieces. You can see the twin cabinets and you can see all of the icons hung on the wall behind the twin brass beds. The brass beds are not original, but Nicholas and Alexandra did sleep together in beds pushed together um, in this sort of canopied area. And um, in the next picture, I'm going to show you, uh, this is the chintz. This is actually better color than uh, the previous uh, pictures, but the overall impression is indeed pink. It is a pink room. <laughs> and um, I think Nicholas really let Alexandra go her own way in that room. It is definitely the room of a young girl who is a bride and is, it's, it's actually a terrific room. In the next picture, um, you can see the chairs. This is the one original chair that survives from the room that has been completely restored. All the other chairs that were made were copies of it, upholstered correctly. I took this picture also because you can see the tassels um, that are on the curtains, which are unbelievable. They are just all made by hand, really extraordinarily and very well done. In the next picture, um, you're going to see a period photo. Oh, there he is. Finally Here's showing the up. horse. Okay. We had Here's a question. What about the horse? <laughs> what about the horse? Here it is. Here's the horse. This was in the palette. Well, a, a version. These sculptures were made in multiples. And a one of the version, one of the copies of this sculpture was in the Palisander room and can be seen in all the photographs. It was by Christina Peterson, who was a Danish sculptor, and it depicts Nicholas II in the uniform of the convoy of the guard on horseback. Peterson was a favorite sculptor of the Dowager Empress. She commissioned this as a gift for Nicholas. We were very fortunate to have one of the versions of this sculpture in our exhibition, Last Days of the Last Tsar, from a private collection. And in fact, Nicholas is wearing the uniform of the Imperial Convoy, the, the escort, which is the theme of the um, exhibition in South Silo, where we lent. Uh, we're giving another option. plug to the exhibition. And exactly. We're, we're Speaking of military, uh, Gabriella is asking, um, did Nicholas sleep in a military cot as well as the children? I guess the answer to that would be no. He slept on a brass bed with his wife. No, he slept in a brass bed with his wife. They were very much in love and they slept together every night of their life that they were in the same place. Um, next picture will take us back to, um, oh, I'm sorry this picture is so small, but it doesn't really matter because you've probably seen it a million times. This is a photograph that depicts the imperial bedroom. Many people say, think that this is what it looked like when Nicholas and Alexandra lived there. This is what it looked like in the 1930s after the Soviets had um, done a sort of reinstallation. And they put every icon they could find on the back wall in order to amplify the idea that Nicholas and Alexandra were religious in the extreme. Um, so it's a little overwhelming to see in these tiny pictures. In the next picture, this is actually a photograph that was taken after the family left in 1917 that was done as part of an inventory. So the icons that the Imperial family took with them had already been removed, but 
this is really more the number of icons that they had in the period. And this is the picture that was used when they did the restoration. And you'll see in the next picture, um, that is a, a, a much more reasonable number than the pictures that are largely associated. Um, in this picture, some of the icons um, are original to Tsarske Silo, but they don't know if they're original to the Imperial Bedchamber. Um, some of them they know were at the Alexander Palace, but they're not sure where they were, but they've all been concentrated as a collection in the bedroom. The beds are period, but not original. And in the next picture, uh, we're moving the, sorry, another view of the same room from the opposite end. This is an object from our collection. Um, sorry, this is from the Synodal Cathedral in New oh, York, but something that we had in our exhibition. Yeah. Sorry, exactly. This is from, as Michael said, um, it is an icon of St. Seraphim of Sarov, who we all know was very important to the imperial family. And it has been painted on a fragment of stone that may have come from the rock on which um, Seraphim of Sarov is said to have prayed for a thousand days. Uh, we know that Empress Alexandra brought this uh, icon with her, both to Tobolsk and to Ekaterinburg, where it was found. So we can presume it was with her at the Alexander Palace when they left. The next. This is the last room. If you pass through the Imperial bedroom, you end up in the um, this first antechamber, which would have been the first room on the left when we came in the front door at the beginning of this chat. And in the period of Nicholas and Alexandra, this room was divided into four small rooms and included a staircase that went up to the second floor level to go to the children's rooms. This room has been restored to its late 18th, early 19th century iteration with an 18th century chandelier and a ceiling painting painted by Anatoly Treskin after the original ceiling paintings of the late 18th century. And this will be where many of the objects that belong to the imperial children will be shown until the rooms upstairs are restored. The, um, you can see here some of the children's toys that are on view. There's a wonderful bear on wheels and some of the girls' dolls and a chair from the uh, children's bedrooms upstairs. Not the doll chair, the big chair in the back. That came from the, the upstairs bedrooms. We have a number of objects in our collection that belong to the imperial children. This one is the prayer book of Cesarevich Alexier with his uh, imperial book plate that was at the Alexander Palace and which would have belonged to him and which he would have used after, I believe it's 1910. The next picture shows a military tunic belonging to the Cesarevich, which was recovered at Ekaterinburg and came into our collection. So it was clearly with him at the Alexander Palace and was packed up and came with him when he left. And we also have, um, this is the expense ledger of Grand Duchess Anastasia from 1915, showing what she spent her money on. And if you read it uh, in Russian, it says over and over again, Tsirkov, 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 it says church, church, church. So she was using um, her money for, um, uh, presumably donations or buying candles and keeping careful records of it. In the next picture, we have uh, two blouses which likely belong to the Grand Duchesses. They were recovered at Ekaterinburg and sent to us uh, over time. They're part of our collection now, but clearly they would have been at the Alexander Palace as well. Finally, the last and probably the most moving piece of our collection, which comes from the Alexander Palace, is this very beautiful icon of the savior not made by hands, which uh, is in the style of Vaznitsov, which was um, a style that was preferred by Nicholas and Alexandra. And this one was a gift from Nicholas II to Grand Duchess Anastasia. Um, it would have hung in her bedroom. I didn't have a picture that I could find today for you guys, but it was taken with her to Tobolsk and then again to Ekaterinburg and it was recovered after the murders and it's now with us at Jordanville. And that is all the time I have. I thank you all for staying much, much longer than we normally go. I see that half of us have stayed to the bitter end. So I, I thank you for this. And if there are any questions, I'm happy to try to answer them. Well, actually, one last question, uh, because I'm wondering the same thing. Uh, there, uh, why were there two beds? If Nicholas and Alexandra were sleeping next to each other, why not just have one larger bed? I don't have the slightest idea. I don't know if maybe there was one mattress originally. I don't know. Maybe her back bothered her and they found two mattresses was better. No clue. Ask a married couple. There, I'm sure there are any number of reasons and none of them have come down to us in documentation. 
So thank you everybody for joining us today. We had a great number of questions, great feedback, wonderful interactions. I think everybody pretty much stayed for the, the duration of this virtual tour really of the Alexander Palace. Um, I've been hearing a lot about it, about the restorations, but until Nick walked me through it, I had no idea what was what. So thank you, Nick, for walking us through this. Thank you to all of you for joining us and we'll see you at one of our future events. Take care. <laughs>